They clinched in Miami days ago, but if you pay attention, you can still smell the combination of beer and champagne wafting through Atlanta as the Braves head back to the postseason as NL East champs for the fifth straight year. This is BPTV, Corey McCartney and Grant McCauley with you here as always as we put a bow on the regular season and I what lies ahead for the defending world champions. Grant, 175 days the Mets were atop the division, and the only days that mattered were the final ones as the Braves claimed the division in the number two spot in the NL bracket. Yeah, I mean, it's not how you start, it's how you finish is one of those old sports cliches that people trot out there, and sometimes it's absolutely true and and holds true, and then other times, you know, you just don't want to hear it because it's the reality of the situation that you find yourself in, and that ultimately was kind of a double-edged sword for the Braves. They can look at that saying and say, wow, we were able to finish the way we wanted to. For the Mets, they can look at that saying and say, yikes, we started off pretty great, and somehow this slipped through our fingers. And it's not just the champagne, not just the beer. I think there's a very distinct uh, aroma of cigar smoke as well that seems to come from a lot of these celebrations. And the Braves are hoping for quite a few more of these, quite honestly. But it was an incredible finish. And when it came down to it, I mean, I know a lot of people have looked at or used the word collapse for the Mets. The Mets didn't just simply fall apart. They did that in 2021. They did that completely a year ago. This year, they played well over 500 ball. They did not take advantage of that schedule that everybody pointed to that was going to allow them to coast right into October as NL East champs, and they left the door open for the Atlanta Braves. And when it came time to win the games you absolutely had to win, the Braves swept that series, and that was how the East was won. Yeah, I mean, the Mets had a 623 second half winning percentage. Yeah. The, the Braves were at 662. They both end up winning 101 games. So this is by no means any at any point a collapse. But when you think about last season, waiting until August 6th to go over 500 for the first mm -hmm. time en route to winning the world championship, I think these Braves arguably increased the degree of difficulty. They trailed in the division every day until September 6th, which is the latest into a season in franchise history that they did had waited to spend their first day atop the division. Uh, obviously, they clinch it with one game to go. The Braves just simply got hotter. The second most wins in baseball after the break. They met the challenge of going through the teeth of the Mets rotation and route to closing the argument. I don't want to get caught up here in recency bias, but and I know each is its own unique snowflake, but this may be the most improbable and impressive division title of this current streak. I mean, think about it this way. The Braves through 50 games were four games under 500. They were 23 and 27. They had to go play nearly 700 baseball for the next four months and going 78 and 34 to meet the Mets, pass the Mets, and hold off the Mets by virtue of that tiebreaker, of course. And I think we all know game 162, once it didn't mean as much, was not going to be played out in quite the same fashion. So ironically, these two teams finished with the exact same record. But with no game 163 scenario to tantalize fans despite the tie, it was what it was. And that was the Braves, I think, overtaking the Mets more than simply the Mets fell apart and couldn't hold on to a lead. They had a great club playing at a historically ridiculous pace for the better part of four months. I went through and looked at this. The Braves, the last time that they were under 500, it was in the early days of their 14-game winning streak, and that was their 53rd game. Since 1901, there have been 52 clubs that have been under 500 through 53 games and went on to make the postseason. Atlanta is one of only two clubs to do this in consecutive seasons, doing it last year and this year, just like the 01 Oakland A's and the 02 Oakland A's. So I don't know if the Braves are going to get a movie deal out of this, but we'll find out. Now, it's, what's funny about this stat, and I know it's kind of like, you know, throwing a dart out there and finding, oh, well, game 53, what does that really matter in the grand scheme of things? Well, it's baseball. We make the numbers say what we need them to say sometimes, but three different clubs were under 500 at the same point of the season the Braves were this year that made the postseason. Atlanta, Philadelphia, and Seattle. So this doesn't happen too terribly often. If you go back to 1901, it's only happened about 50 times, and the Braves are the only club that's done it twice in the National League. I'd say that's just one of the many little improbable factors and stories that you can look at to try to frame what the Braves did in chasing down the Mets to win the NL East and get back into the postseason. Yeah, another one for you. I mean, they were the only team to not be swept in the majors this season, yep. just a six since 1990 to do that. And when we look at keys to this season, I mean, I think you can quantify it as a season of Dansby Swanson, who had a career year, the season of Austin Riley, who did the same, the season of Kyle Wright, who ends up as the MLB wins leader in his true breakout season. You wouldn't be wrong in saying any of those things are true, but it feels very, very right to call this the season of Michael Harris II and Spencer Strider.
Sure. I mean, and these are guys who were key to the Braves' success because when you do look at when the Braves started going on that clip where they played nearly 700 baseball winning percentage wise, and yes, if for those of you scoring at home, that's extremely good. It was right after Michael Harris got called up from double A, and it was right after Spencer Strider got installed in the Braves' starting rotation. And those are two guys, that quite obviously, as they're vying for rookie of the year honors, were huge parts of the Braves' success. And you know, the fact that the Braves never lost more than three games all season long, as far as losing streaks are concerned, that also is one of the things, one of the outcomes that it comes from being a club that wins seven out of every 10 games. Well, by the simple math, you're not going to lose three in a row too terribly often. And the Braves did not get swept. And the 2004 Braves also went through a club or through a season where they did not get swept. Now, I made the mistake of tweeting this out on the day that the Braves went ahead and clinched with that 2-1 victory. And I think there was two valuable lessons learned. Number one, I am amazed to know the number of people that believe in jinxes. And number two, nothing that comes from my Twitter account is ever going to affect actual events in this universe or any other. <laughs> well, yeah, there's the magic in Twitter, that's for sure. But I mean, on the topic of Harrison Strider, I mean, obviously you mentioned these guys are, you know, rookie of the year favorites. They may finish one, two. They may share the award. Who knows how the voting's going to come out? I mean, obviously Harris, third in the team and fan graph four at four eight. He just missed that 2020 season, leads uh, all NL rookie position players. Meanwhile, Strider, 0.1 war of uh, just that's all he was behind Max Free for the top pitcher, which I think, you know, just uh, incredible considering at what point he joined that rotation. Strider has the highest fan graph war of any Braves rookie pitcher since world war ii harris is second to only rico cardi in 1964 the most impactful rookie class in terms of overall depth the highest combination of, of war for top position player mm -hmm. and top pitcher in terms of rookies in franchise history yeah i mean i just don't think that there's a way that the braves are winning the east without what harris and strider meant to this team no no chance and if you think about what michael harris did winning rookie of the month three separate times spencer strider won it once might have won it a couple of more times if not for the fact that harris was there just seemingly getting better as the season wore on but you know Spencer Strider's rookie of the year case has its own merits and you know the 200 strikeout season the fastest pitcher in MLB history in terms of innings to reach 200 strikeouts and just the consistency the no pun intended shot in the arm that he gave the Braves rotation that very much had some questions at the back end before he was put into that crew so it's incredible to see what both of those two guys did whoever wins a rookie of the year award that's great but I think the winning on the field is what both of those two men who seem to be, you know, wise beyond their years in terms of their baseball acumen and in terms of you know, how they go about doing all the things that they do. This wasn't a couple of rookies playing above their head for a while until the league figured them out. This is a couple of guys that I think are going to be big time building blocks. And obviously Harris has already been locked into a long term contract for helping the Braves and to help the Braves to do this kind of thing on an annual basis. So the Braves in the regular season, fourth in the NL and fan graph four, first in homers, the pitching staff, fourth in fan graph four, fifth in rotation ERA, second in bullpen ERA. What's the biggest question mark for you for this team heading into the postseason? I think if I've seen anything that has been at times a bit troublesome for the Braves, it is when slash if the offense kind of goes into one of these lulls where it just can't seem to find hits with runners in scoring position. Maybe the strikeouts pile up a little bit more. And I know there's been that old adage that, well, good pitching you know, or great pitching beats good hitting or, or how, wherever the good and the great goes, you know, we all know what I'm talking about, but that's not always the case. I feel like the Braves offense was one of the big reasons why they won it all last year, because they did hit those big home runs when they needed to, and they were able to get the big hits when they were needed. It wasn't blowing everybody out 10 to one. And I don't think any team goes into the postseason and gets on that kind of run, but the Braves need their offense to be able to show up and be the kind of team that it was, frankly, in that three-game series against the Mets. It may not be scoring, you know, eight, nine, ten runs per night, but if you score five or six with this pitching staff, I feel like you've got a chance to win, oh, I don't know, based on the last four months, seven out of every ten games or every single series you play just about, and that's what the Braves have done for a while. So the offense, to me, Corey, is the big focus, and I think, you know, we all know, you got to score runs to win games. The Braves' offense is capable of doing it. They just can't afford any kind of letdown in their offensive production. So going off that, I mean, obviously we saw Matt Olson, Austin Riley, DNSB Swanson all turning on over the final weeks. But I do wonder, what is this team going to get production-wise at second base? Because they were 15th and way to run create a plus over that last month. No Ozzy Albies, presumably for the LDS per Alex right. Anthopoulos' comments after the division clincher. Uh, certainly he continues to deal with that fractured pinky. Vaughn Grissom hit 200 with a 538 OPS his last 12 games. Orlando Arcia looked strong to close, but his last three postseasons, he has a 521 OPS. So I wonder, what are they 
they going to get out of that position? If you get Albies back for the LCS and he can continue, you know, to look like he has at some points throughout his career, that's a fantastic get, but I just don't know consistency wise, what they're going to get early on. And then I look at, you know, the pitching wise, I mean, we talked about sensor strider, he's throwing and uh, Anthopoulos had mentioned that there's, he's got a shot at the LDS, but obviously a big lift getting him back. But then what happens after the after that, if you need to go a little bit deeper into your uh, into your staff there uh, to get through that second round, one day off in the LDS, they're going to need four starters. If it's Freed, Strider, if he's back and right, what's Charlie Morton going to be able to do? He had a 6-2-3 ERA in his last five starts. Morton's effectiveness with five starts of four or more earned runs in the second half. He's allowed more home runs than at any point in his career. I think what they're able to get from him, too, in that rotation is going to be a big talking point. It absolutely has to be. And when you look at the pitchers that have the best postseason resume, it's Charlie Morton and then a little gap. And then you find Max Fried there. Ian Anderson's not even a factor. I mean, he has the best postseason numbers of, of any Braves pitcher, arguably. And he's not going to be on the staff because he's hurt. And he had a really bad season. So he's not part of the depth that you could lean on if you wanted to have those kind of options. So it's important, clearly, to get Spencer Strider back because I feel like if and when healthy, he's the guy that you pair with Max Fried. And then it's Kyle Wright and Charlie Morton. And I think right in front of Morton right now, just based on the consistency that Wright has given you throughout the course of the season, way more times than not. And the fact that Charlie has been fighting it and it has been the home run ball that has been his undoing in a lot of these starts. Now, sometimes it's just a couple of solo shots and then he gets the strikeout pitches working and the curve ball is, you know, doing its thing. But we saw in the last start that he made, you know, and, and you know, Brian Snicker in that Met series, as a matter of fact, manage that series just like he would manage a postseason game in that if you cannot get outs then we'll go batter to batter and if it's the fourth inning fifth inning we'll go ahead and go to that bullpen start playing matchups and see if we can't you know hit enough to get this game where we need it to get and that you know can work has worked and that's what the Braves did a year ago and it just may look a little bit different but you need Charlie Morton to step up I mean he's the guy that was brought in to kind of be the the experienced veteran of the staff he has been that but He's had some ups and some downs in 2022, and he's just trying to find, I think the word all year long that I've been attaching to this is consistency. If he can find that, he's a net positive for the Braves. No two ways about it. Yeah, and if it does end up going uh, deeper than four and you don't have Strider, obviously, then you're looking at potentially Bryce Elder. You're looking at uh, potentially Jake Odorizzi. And I think, obviously, the Braves would much rather have Spencer Strider in the mix going into whoever that matchup's against. And looks look at it. I mean, it's either going to be the central champion Cardinals or the wild card Phillies for the Braves. They were four and three against St. Louis in the year. They lost the series against them in August. They were 11 and eight against the Phillies. Outscored both of those teams in the regular season series. You can always say it's the enemy you know and all that that makes the Phillies a better pick for the Braves, but who do you think's the ideal matchup? I do think it's the Phillies. I don't think there's a big gap between these two clubs, but I feel like the Cardinals are playing such a better brand of baseball in the second half, and they have something to play for that you know, well, everybody's got the World Series play to play for and the, the goal of getting there and being the last team standing. But they've got some you know Cardinal legends who are in their last dance, so to speak, and in their last act. And what better way than to march through October and win another World Series, something the St. Louis Cardinals have done better than any other team than the New York Yankees in the history of that great event. So, you know, they're a team that's been dangerous in the postseason many, many years, and the Braves know all about it from 2019. It would be great to give them a receipt for that one, maybe a receipt for the one 10 years ago that I'm not going to mention that was only one game and was a complete debacle. But then again, the 2022 Braves aren't focused on what happened three years ago and what happened 10 years ago, most certainly. Most of the guys on this club don't have that bitter taste in their mouth. They've got the taste of champagne from what they did last year and what they have already done this year in taking those steps forward. So I think this Cardinals team is a very good club. I think their bullpen is extremely dangerous. I know the Phillies are a little bit better in, in that regard there. The rotation, I would give the Phillies the edge. The offense, I think the Cardinals have a slight edge over the Phillies, though I know they've got Kyle Schwarber and I know that they've got Bryce Harper, quite obviously some big home run hitters, but it just seems like the Cardinals have been playing a better brand of baseball in the last couple of three months to take the NL Central away from the Brewers, who, by the way, did pretty much collapse in allowing the Cardinals to take that division. It'll be interesting to see who comes out of that series because it's just three straight games and no days off. And then whoever does, they're going to have to have used the best bullets that they have to try to, you know, fire them all to get through those three games and then turn around and play the, the NLDS. So there's another advantage for the Braves with whoever comes out of that series, you would assume. 
Yeah, that Albert Pujols, Yadier Molina retirement tour has been one of the league's, uh, the year's best stories. Obviously, you've got Nolan Arenado, Paul Goldschmidt, two and three in the NL and Fangraph Four. So they got a couple guys that are going to be the MVP conversation. But the Phillies have the better pitching staff, better on the season, better in the second half, better since the All Star break. And even after St. Louis went out and got those reinforcements, Philly starters lead the NL, the NL in WAR. Second only the Astros. Aaron Nola leads the majors with a six three WAR. Zach Wheeler's been very good at two eight two ERA. Teams that out homer their opponent. Opponents this last postseason were 20 and two. The Phillies had three guys with 20 or more, including the NL leader, as you mentioned, Kyle Schwarber. And that's only three because Bryce Harper uh, missed so much time and only right. had 18. The Cardinals obviously have momentum on their side, but if pitching and homers define the postseason, I wouldn't be surprised if it's the Phillies and the Braves that end up facing each other. No, it would not be shocking at all. And again, I'll go back to the first thing I said is I don't feel like a lot separates these two clubs in terms of how dangerous they are and what they can do. I do think the Phillies starting staff has that nod. I, I like the Cardinals bullpen a little bit more. I think hitting wise, I, I still look at that group and particularly the otherworldly run that Pujols got on. The fact that you probably have the NL MVP on one of the two corners of that infield. And the Cardinals are just a team that when they get to October, they put it into a different gear. They have a different level. The Phillies haven't been there in 11 years. So I can't accurately judge this year's Phillies club based on recent events because they haven't been there in a while. The cards just seem to find a way. So uh, we'll see who comes out of it. And then, of course, for the Braves, the object is to just focus on doing things the way they've done it all year long. And that is win that day's game, win that series, and then advance. That's the name of the postseason, and the Braves know that playing pretty well. Well, now they just get to sit back, relax, and wait until the NLDS. But before that happens, we'll be back with plenty more here on BP TV. So subscribe, turn on those notifications. Plus, don't forget, you can find us on From the Diamond on 92.9 The Game in Atlanta or wherever you find your podcasts. Until next time, I'm Corey McCartney. He's Grant McCauley, and we'll see you soon, Braves country.